Rebecca, how are we looking? Almost we there. We are three away. Although we might have lost one. We did. So four away. Uh, we just gained one. Okay, that should be everybody. That should be enough for um, quorum. Unless, because uh, Craig is uh, makes quorum, but his audio is not connecting, so I don't oh. know if that technically counts. Just connected. So I think it does. Good. Okay, so it sounds like we have uh, quorum. So welcome everybody to the July land use meeting. And we will start out with the first item on the agenda, which is the uh, land use item, the public hearing. Um, so I will turn it over to the Browning School and their representatives for their presentation. I just gonna take a couple moments for us to unmute all of the folks who are gonna be speaking. So give us one moment to get everybody settled. Okay, uh, so you have Eric starting up. So Eric, if you wanna introduce your colleagues. Sure, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Knowles. I'm a land use attorney at the firm uh, Fox Rothschild. We're here on behalf of uh, the Browning School. Um, I think we have Siddle um, Patel from S9. Siddle, if you wanna um, share the screen. If he, has, if he has access to do that, because he has our, our presentation. Yeah, of course. I do. Great. Um, so yeah, so thanks again for having us in. Uh, my name is Eric Knowles. I'm a land use attorney at uh, Fox Rothschild. Um, we're here on behalf of the Browning School, which I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with. Um, we're actually very excited to be here to um, share with you their proposal for uh, the relocation of the upper school to a, a new um, site at 337 East 64th Street. It's been uh, a long time coming. 
Um, and as a school, they're, they're thrilled to, to finally have a, a new space um, and to um, you know, move there in the, in the coming years. And, and we're here before you because they're, they're seeking a few small um, modifications to the uh, zoning resolution for a, a variance from the VSA. Um, so yeah, with me, I just, just uh, give a quick overview. With me is Jerry Johnson, um, who's a colleague of mine at Fox Rothschild. John Boddy, uh, the headmaster of Browning is here. Um, Siddle Patel, uh, the lead architect from the firm uh, S9 is here um, and on hand to answer questions at the end. We have uh, Nathaniel Rotsko from Philip Aviva Associates, which is the uh, environmental consultant, um, Aaron Schwartz from Plan A Architecture and Kenny Marshall and um, John Campbell from Browning. Um, so just as kind of a brief overview, the reason we're here is because Browning um, has outgrown their current facilities. Um, you know, they've been at this location on East 62nd Street for about 100 years. Um, and they've been looking for a decade for a new location for their upper school. Um, and it's been, they've had some deals fall through. It's been kind of a, a tough, a tough road to get there, but they finally found this location that they see as the best amongst other contenders to, to suit their needs. Um, you know, John will get into it more momentarily, but the, the East 62nd Street facility um, was not really purpose built for a, a school of 400 plus students, K through 12 um, and 100 faculty. Um, and it's caused some spatial constraints and problems in terms of um, best teaching practices. Um, and, you know, the, the move to the, the new um, site at East 64th Street is, is essentially to give more space to the high schoolers who, who need it to provide them with the proper academic um, experiences um, that they think they deserve. Um, and also in terms of athletic facilities to provide um, space that is high quality and meets the needs of um, uh, the upper school students, which they, they don't currently have at their um, building. Um, so in order to do that, we are proposing to convert a five-story building um, at 337 East 64th Street um, to a transient parking garage, from a transient parking garage use to a used group three school. Um, just by background, it's a building that was built in 1917 for auto related uses. Um, there's a, also a Hertz rental, um, I think facility um, operating out of there. Um, and it's been auto related for a hundred years. Um, and, you know, also by the fact that it was built a hundred years ago, there are some existing uh, non-compliances. Um, one in particular, uh, a 10 foot deep rear yard that we'll, we'll touch on later. Um, you know, and in addition to the conversion, we're proposing to enlarge uh, the building by about 20 feet to accommodate um, the regulation sized uh, basketball court um, on the top floor and to enclose a fire escape um, in the rear yard and replace it with a code required uh, egress there. And as I mentioned, we're, we're here because we're seeking a, a variance from the BSA for a, a small modification to height and rear yard requirements. Uh, next slide. So just quickly, um, just to orient everybody, um, the site's in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, it's an R8B zoning district with a C25 commercial overlay. Right there. Um, here's the area map. You can see the site on the north side of East 64th Street uh, between 1st and 2nd Avenues. Um, immediately to the west is the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Outpatient Center. Um, across the street to the south is a one-story on Edison Station, which takes up much of the mid-block. And the brown and yellow areas uh, or buildings you see elsewhere are either entirely residential or a mixed use, but primarily residential with uh, commercial on the ground floor. Um, and I will point out, it's, it's not on this map, but at 340 East 64th Street, just across the street, there is a below grade parking garage. And there's also another below grade um, parking garage um, at 301 East 64th Street, a few um, buildings. Uh, to the west. And next slide. Um, here's just an aerial, just again to orient everybody. Um, you can see kind of in the mid block here, you know, low to, to mid rise buildings is the typical development, um, which is, is characteristic of this neighborhood. Um, and then on the avenues are the larger, you know, residential towers and, and large residential buildings. Um, and now I'll turn over to John to speak more about the school. Eric, thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for making the time this evening. I really appreciate it. I want to 
tell you a little bit about the Browning School, which is an independent school for boys that serves roughly 400 students from, from kindergarten uh, through 12th grade. Uh, as Eric mentioned, our school was founded in 1888, and for you know, the past 100 years, it's been located on East 62nd Street, where we occupy space in, in two adjoining buildings at 40 and 52 uh, East 62nd between Madison and Park Avenues. Uh, we're composed of three divisions, a, a lower, a middle, and an upper school. And these divisions employ about 100 faculty and staff. Uh, we're also a college preparatory school with a mission to foster the growth of courageous and compassionate men of, of intellect and integrity who will contribute meaningfully uh, to our world. And ultimately, we hope to use rigorous liberal arts, uh, robust extracurricular opportunities, and deep personal relationships to help today's boys become tomorrow's men, uh, gentlemen who will lead lives informed by the values of honesty and curiosity and dignity and purpose. And so our mission then isn't just intellectual, but it instead it gathers in the whole of the boy uh, to help him develop as a student, surely, but also as an artist, an athlete, a citizen, and a friend. And as, as you can imagine, uh, this requires a lot of boys, but it also uh, places real demands on the facilities uh, and the spaces that the boys occupy as well. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, you know, what we found over the past decade, uh, particularly as the size of our upper school has increased, is that the facilities on East 62nd Street uh, are no longer matched to our needs. As, as Eric said, you know, we, we've outgrown our build uh, quite simply, and this is curtailing the delivery of our mission. Uh, in the academic realm, uh, this shows up principally uh, in a crowded school building with a shortage of both classrooms and, and space within those classrooms. Uh, our oldest boys, our upper schoolers, uh, they struggle to fit into classroom spaces, which are largely designed uh, for smaller students. Uh, the teachers are constrained in, in the pedagogical approaches they can use is the space often doesn't allow for, for small group work, right, or more dynamic modes of instruction. And because virtually all lab space is shared by boys from all three divisions, we can't really devote rooms uh, to the most innovative and novel equipment for STEM and robotics and computer science work that would serve older students. Um, you know, and we also pair this with a high classroom utilization rate. You know, there, there's seldom uh, a classroom that's free during the day. And so it makes scheduling K through 12 classes an incredible challenge. Uh, and it makes it difficult to set aside collaborative time among departmental colleagues or to create opportunities for, for interdisciplinary classes or, or, or practices. Um, you know, given uh, also our, our, our emphasis on boys' development of, of personal independence, a sense of purpose and, and strong relationships, we encourage them to engage in a variety of extracurricular activities and clubs, which are happily often generated and led by the students themselves, but these opportunities are, are significantly restricted uh, by a shortage of physical meeting space. And, and boys' enthusiasm candidly tends to ebb um, when they're forced to do battle with other clubs for the occasional empty classroom, or, or they're asked to arrive at school prior to its opening uh, simply to guarantee a space to meet, uh, which is an incredible hardship for some of our boys who are coming from great distances. So in short, our, our, our present facility doesn't allow us to, to hold the classes that we need. It doesn't allow us to teach as we need. And it doesn't allow us to gather as we need. I and mean, all this makes it difficult uh, to live the academic and community sides uh, of our mission. Could I get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so, so Browning wants boys to have the opportunity to explore all sides of themselves. And, and for some students, uh, a big part of that is athletics. And while sports aren't required, uh, they're often a great way of expressing our community values, such as compassion and courage and and honesty and purpose. And unfortunately, uh, our, our facilities are once again actively working against the delivery of the, of the best parts of our mission. You know, we have two uh, substantially undersized gymnasia in our present facility, uh, neither of which is large enough to accommodate uh, a competitive middle school basketball game or a sanctioned upper school basketball game, uh, let alone accommodate the practice needs of, of, of six different middle school and upper school teams. And as a consequence, uh, we have to rent court space from the Equinox gym on, on 61st Street. And, you know, not only is this an additional expense, but it also alienates the teams from the rest of the student community, right? It, it, it's one thing to go to support your friends uh, at a game in a gym within your own school, but it's, it, it's another to, to head out into the winter and walk 10 minutes to an unaffiliated uh, commercial workout center uh, to watch a game among uh, a host of strangers. All right. So both the size of our gyms and the fact that they're constantly in use by boys uh, from five to 18, uh, it really challenges our school in all kinds of ways. It, it hinders the quality of our team play. Uh, it can discourage participation, frankly, and, and it makes commuting, uh, community building uh, much more difficult. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, the proposal to reimagine the facility uh, at 337 East 64th uh, is geared toward giving us the best chance 
uh, to deliver our mission fully, uh, especially for our older students. All right, it, it'll offer us a, a regulation sized gym with real spectator seating, and this will help both athletic play and community engagement. Uh, it'll offer us uh, expanded convocation space, which will allow us to, to program more frequent and more effective school meetings and assemblies and dramatic and musical performances and guest speakers and, and inter-school partnerships. Uh, it'll, it'll allow us to create uh, purpose-built classroom spaces that can meet the needs of both students and teachers uh, with more space for instructional variety uh, and equipment meant to, to serve the size and skills uh, of older students. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to, to, to gradually increase our, our overall enrollment uh, by about 100 students over the course of seven years. And this increased enrollment in turn will allow us to boost the number of academic electives and, and, and co-curricular opportunities we can offer, uh, as well as open up possibilities for more diverse relationships uh, as, as grade level sizes will increase from about 30 to about 45 boys uh, in, in the upper school. And so all of this enhances the expression of a mission, uh, which is based upon both intellectual growth and personal connection. Finally, I should add that separating the upper school from the lower and middle schools would allow our facilities both at 62nd and 64th Street to have more room and more flexibility and more opportunity uh, for serving the specific constituents uh, for which they are ultimately designed. You know, so to us, uh, this building project, uh, it, it's not a bauble. It's not something that's, that's quote unquote nice to have. Uh, it's really a must uh, for our school if we're gonna deliver uh, our mission fully uh, and properly. You know, for, for Browning to be around for its third century, uh, we need this because you know, otherwise our mission suffers and we can't honor our promise uh, to our families and our communities to educate the whole boy in the way we say we do. So we haven't pushed out of our existing facility, as Eric mentioned, in a century, but we need to do so now. Uh, it, it's necessary, we believe, if we're going to be the school we've tried to be uh, and the school that we promised to be. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right, so you can go to the next one. So thank you, John. That was, I think, incredibly well said. Um, so before Siddle jumps in and, and walks through the architecture, um, just a quick overview of what the, the school um, will be. Uh, once um, converted and enlarged, it'll have about 47,000 square feet of floor area. It's a 4.7 FAR um, building. It's about 9,000 square foot increase of what's there now. Um, that's as of right um, in this in this R8B district. Uh, the max, for an all community facility building, the, the maximum FAR is 5.1. Um, it'll have five stories plus a mezzanine, about 83 feet tall. Um, the cellar will contain a library and cafeteria. Um, the main academic floors will be the first through the fourth floor. Um, the fifth floor will contain the regulation size gym um, and some attendant uh, athletic facility space, athletic offices and the like. Um, that gym will also be able to accommodate um, 200 people for assemblies and events, which as John mentioned is, is pretty important for the, the consortia. Um, the roof, it'll be unoccupied, um, but it'll be a green roof designed uh, to city guidelines. Classroom sizes ranging from about 530 square feet to 649 um, with the scale up rooms that Sid will mention momentarily, uh, one combined up to about 1500 square feet. And there'll be a, a school safety drop off zone uh, adjacent to the building. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of the zoning waivers, why we're, why we're here, is because we're seeking two waivers from the BSA, one for height, one for rear yard. Um, in this district, the, the maximum height is 75 feet. Um, and our enlargement um, as proposed will be 83 feet. So it's a small, in our opinion, eight foot uh, increase um, to accommodate the gym on the top floor. Um, and then in terms of the rear yard, um, as I mentioned, it's there's a, a, about a 10 foot um, legal um, non-complying rear yard that's existing, we would propose to um, maintain that not complying rear yard um, up above the existing height to the overall height, um, and then to um, replace a fire escape in the rear yard um, with a required egress there. Um, as I mentioned, the FAR is as of right, the school uses as of right, we're not seeking waivers for that. Um, it's just the small height increase and uh, increase into the rear yard. Um, so I'll turn it over to Siddle. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, good evening, members of the community. Um, my name is Siddle Patel. I am a uh, principal with S9 Architecture, and uh, we are the architect for the project and the school. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to briefly go through the plans and the design for you, um, and 
any questions or if, if you need any elaborate uh, me, me to elaborate on anything, certainly happy to do that in the in the question and answer. Uh, so I'll start with the site plan. So plan uh, of the building looking down on the roof. Uh, 64th Street is towards the bottom of the page. North um, is uh, along the top. Uh, essentially, on, on the roof level, we have mechanical equipment. And as Eric had mentioned, we are going to do a green roof, a green blue roof. So it will both retain water and also be green um, with sedum trays. Uh, this is the cellar level plan. This is one level below street level. Again, 64th Street is towards the bottom of the page. Um, at this level, we essentially have a dining hall and a library. Uh, the dining hall will function both uh, to serve during lunchtime, obviously, but then also off, uh, off lunch hours. It, it is a, uh, a space for the students uh, for study study hour and also a gathering space for the faculty and staff to get together um, in, in a in a communal space. Uh, this is the ground floor. Uh, main entry is sort of mid building um, down here through. There will be classrooms at this level as well as offices and support spaces. Uh, you'll see two stairs, two egress stairs. One in the rear yard. Back here, that's stair B. That is essentially in the same location as the existing fire escape is today. Uh, and then a grand, scare, uh, grand stair towards uh, 64th Street, uh, which is also a means of egress. Um, second floor, and, and as I go through, I'm gonna, you'll, you'll see a repetition in sort of how these floors lay out. Uh, compact floor plan, uh, essentially support spaces along one side classrooms uh, along the top and bottom, north and south, with lab space in the middle. Um, Eric mentioned uh, scale-up classrooms. When we talk about scale-up classrooms, it's really these classrooms along 64th Street uh, that operate both independently as two classrooms and then via a retractable wall that can recede. You can then have one large classroom or scale-up classroom where an entire grade can sit at once in a classroom setting together. Uh, third floor, similar to second floor, the scale up classrooms towards 64th Street, uh, several classrooms along the north, and then lab space, art, maker, engineering space with office in the center of the, the floor plan. Uh, fourth floor plan, again, um, same configuration. On this floor, we have offices. Uh, there's a mix of uh, teacher space and student space intermingled on every floor. Uh, so it's a dynamic educational setting. Uh, the fifth floor is where we have uh, the basketball and volleyball court. This is uh, the minimum regulation size for national high school standards. So the 50 by 80 foot, 84 foot court. Um, with seating and then uh, accessory space in terms of fitness and lockers uh, along 64th Street. And uh, this space, of course, is a double height space. And so we do have a, a small mezzanine overlooking um, the basketball or sports, sports courts. Um, this is an elevation. So this is on 64th Street looking towards the building. Um, essentially elevator, bulkhead and stair bulkhead and then the the new addition above the existing um, to that that 82 foot three um, height uh, that Eric had mentioned. This is the rear yard. Uh, if you're standing in the rear yard uh, looking looking south, um, you can see the addition uh, above the 75 foot mark. This white this large white space is that stair and I have a rendering I can show you uh, of what that's going to look like. Uh, this is a cross section through the building. So 64th Street is on your right. The, uh, the rear yard is towards your left. Um, the existing floor to floor heights um, from cellar through the fifth floor are the existing floor to floor heights. We were not changing those. Um, and then you see the basketball court, uh, the sports uh, volume with that 25 foot minimum national high school standard uh, clear height that we're, we're meeting. Um, and to just quickly touch on the waivers that we're seeking at the BSA, this is a pretty good illustration of it. That hatched area that you see 
uh, that Siddle's pointing to right now, that's an existing portion of the building. That's the existing um, building in the in the rear yard. Um, so we're not seeking a waiver for that. What we're only seeking a waiver for is the shaded areas along the rear and the top of the building. And then you kind of see where where they cross. That's where we're asking for uh, a waiver above the existing building height up to the um, up to the the top height. Um, but I think the next, yeah, I think this this illustration um, probably is more telling again how minimal what we're what we think we're seeking. Um, it's a it's a strip on the top floor um, to accommodate the gym, the enclosure of the stair um, in the the rear yard, and then kind of where they meet just to um, uh, increase the the volume um, to accommodate the the basketball court in the in the gym space. Um, next slide. And just quickly again, in contextual, you know, even with the enlargement, it's pretty similar in, in size to other buildings on East 64th Street and in the block, um, about 92 feet. Um, and, or low 90s is about the, the height of all bulkheads there. Um, the next slide is, all, yeah, this slide is also, you know, pretty indicative of, you know, that, we're, that the building will be contextual um, as enlarged. The next slide. Here's just a street view. Um, the, the enlargement will be set back 15 feet um, above the, the current building height. So, you know, not, not up against the, the street line, but um, set back in compliance with zoning. Next slide. And then in terms of the rear yard, um, you know, the, the, this block is, is not the typical donut you might see. If you look at a, a bird's eye view of another block um, elsewhere in the city, um, in terms of the rear yard, you know, there, there are many different unique and um, pretty narrow rear yards, all less than 30 feet and, and our site's no different. So we, we think again, in terms of um, the configuration of rear yards in the block, we're, we're pretty consistent um, with the enclosure of the stair. Uh, so the, the, the existing building, um, these are just a comparison side of existing versus proposed. So the existing building uh, to the left, um, and the uh, what we're proposing uh, to the right, which is essentially a full facade renovation, cleaning, some repointing, and then obviously uh, new fenestration in the existing arches. Um, the overbuild, as we, we indicate here, uh, which really reflects the elevator bulkhead and then the expansion uh, for the for the gym. Uh, this is the rear yard. So this is standing in the neighbor's uh, yard looking towards our building, uh, similar to the facade, a full uh, renovation uh, of, the, of the facade with new uh, windows and brick cleaning. Um, and what you see here, with, uh, what you see here is the existing condition, the fire escape. Um, and in the proposed, uh, we, are, we would replace the fire escape with a fully compliant, modernized egress stair, and then enclose it um, in, a, in a contextual material. Uh, this is a rendered section, uh, 3D section through the building. 64th Street is on your right, the, the rear yard is on your left. And then you can see the volume of space, the double height volume for that uh, dining commons area I mentioned at the beginning from the cellar to the ground floor. And then you can see the large uh, volume um, for the basketball and sports, uh, sports area on the fifth floor. Um, so just a few uh, images of what the spaces uh, will hopefully look like. Uh, this is in this is on the fifth floor in what we would call like an auditorium or a gathering setting. Um, same space in a basketball uh, game situation. Uh, this is a the the library cafeteria area I mentioned in the cellar level. Uh, and this is just a would be a prototypical lab lab science or lab space um, uh, in in the in the school and typical classroom uh, with the with the you can see the arched uh, opening along 64th Street which we we hope to uh, showcase. Um, this is uh, standing on the ground floor, looking down towards the cellar and the, that double height space, the meeting area and dining area um, configuration. So that was it, thank you. We're happy to take any questions. Thank you. So um, this now portion is effectively a, a committee meeting. So if there are folks from the public who have uh, 
questions uh, or comments, we can hear from them. And then we'll also go to uh, board members. So as ever, uh, raise your hand and uh, you will be recognized to be unmuted. So I don't see anybody from the public. So we will go to members of the board and we will start with Ed at Hartsock. And I'll just remind everybody that you can participate by going to the reactions icon and pressing the raise hand button, or if you're calling in from the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. Go ahead, Ed. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Russell. Um, I will be very brief. Um, as many of you on the board know, my son does go to Browning and the only, uh, I will just speak to the fact that I, I can attest to uh, the need for space um, at their current location. Um, we've been there eight years now. My son is a rising upper school uh, young gentleman and um, they had a renovation at that location. So I can, I can attest to the fact that they do need the space and um, that's all I will just say is I think it's a fine proposal. I, I like it, but um, that that was all. I just wanted to throw that out there, and that was it. So thank great. you. Yep. All right. Next, let's go to Judy Schneider. Hi. Thank you all very much for the presentation. Um, I want to start out by saying for those board members that don't know. Um, I've lived across the street from this building for 55 years. So I am very happy to see that the Browning School is going to keep the building intact and refurbish the outside. And um, I think our neighbors all are. However, we are very disappointed that we are losing um, garage space because that's really in need for the neighborhood. I do have some questions um, I'd like to ask. Um, will this be, will the um, basketball be for just for the middle students or will the high school students be coming down here to play basketball as well? Uh, John, do you wanna answer that one? John Body, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was I was trying to unmute. I uh, had a little little challenge. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Schneider's question. Yeah, the the, the direct answer is uh, the the basketball facility will principally be used by our upper school students who would be in the building. Uh, occasionally, middle school students would uh, we envision come over to take advantage of the facility uh, as well. Wait, I'm confused. I thought this was supposed to be a middle school. You're telling me this is a high school. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's the, the crux of our position is this is this is supposed to be our new upper school building. Oh, well, I guess I misread your documents because I thought I read that this was a middle school. So thank you for straightening that out. Um, approximately um, any idea, assuming this all gets approved during the normal approval process, when the garage will close and when the construction will start. Do we have any approximate dates on that? Um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn over to Sal. I mean, if, if you know all goes well, you know, I, I, and this is approved in the next several months, um, I think we'd be ready to, to start um, construction um, soon thereafter. I don't know, you know, we don't, we don't represent the, the garage owner, so we don't know when that would close, but um, I'll, I don't know if still you can, um, add anything to that. So are we looking at the garage closing by the end of the year at the, uh, would you say? Starting next year, the garage would be out of business. Um, I, I do not know. Um, okay, I mean, so can, maybe- we can, we can say when we can, when we're planning to begin construction, um, which I think okay. I believe is as soon as this project we get approved. Okay, so maybe you can get back to me on that. Um, you, you said there would be a school safety drop-off zone. Can we go back to the front of the school picture? And can you show us where the school safety drop-off sign uh, would be? Sure. So that zone would be directly in front of uh, if you can see the hand, uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it would be a, a 60 foot zone uh, centered on the front door. Okay, so this is, we're talking about walking students. We're not talking about buses, are we? Uh, correct, yeah, the, we've actually, we've done a survey um, that primarily students come here by either walking or subway. Um, there's no, there's no busing. Um, you know, maybe there would be a bus um, occasionally to, for a field trip or to go to, you know, an away basketball game, but there's, there's no plan for um, a row of buses every day coming in. Um, I don't know if Nathaniel, if you can, I know you have the breakdown of what, how the high schoolers uh, get to school now. Um, I don't know if you can share that. He's muted. Will, can you unmute him? I know he has the option. Okay. I got it. Um, hi, yeah, Nathaniel Rotsko from Philip Abib and Associates. Uh, so we, perf uh, we performed a survey of um, the existing uh, upper school students. So you figure out how they get to school. Uh, it was really pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so you've got about 60% who either take the subway or the bus. Uh, and then about 17% who walk. Um, so lumped together because the students would be walking to and from, you know, the, the stations or the bus stops. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at nearly 80% of students walking. Um, in the morning, you have about 16% of students who uh, are driven. Uh, and we're, we're um, you know, mostly by parents drop on their way to school or on their way to work because in the afternoon that drops in half to about 7% uh, in the 3 p.m. hour and then down to down below that in the um, after school program. So um, yeah, vast majority of students are taking public transit. Thank you very much. And I have one last question on, um, this is for the architect. Um, the bulkhead and the gymnasium part of the building that's shown in your first picture, um, can you tell us what materials are being used? Um, yeah, that one. Can you tell us what the black for the bulkhead and the kind of light beige color it looks like? Is that brick? What materials are you planning on using? And also, I guess, for the staircase as well in the back. Uh, what, why don't I start on the back first and then I'll go to the front. So, uh, on the rear, we are considering a like material to the brick, brick or a, a stucco, but essentially a harmonious material. We want it to feel like it was built contiguous to when the brick was built. Um, on the front, um, these, the, the, the restoration of the metalwork, we would like it to sort of carry up onto the bulkhead. So I think we're looking at most likely metal. And then there is, uh, there is wood, there's a language of wood that we want to express as well. Um, so I think it'll be probably a, a complement uh, of two materials, metal and wood. Okay, so what I thought was blick, black, uh, brick where your hand is right now, that's going to be wood. That'll either be wood or a, or a metal. Some I think we're, we're right now the composition is uh, between the arches today. You have metal. You have steel windows and a steel spandrel, right. and we're obviously going to restore all that. And then I think our idea is just to carry that up. So it is this is all modern material, but it doesn't look out of place. It doesn't look like we came in at a later time and dropped something on top of this building. We no, I to... think your rendering is terrific. I think it looks wonderful. And the black on the bottom is gonna be what? Uh, this, in terms of the windows? No, the, the walls. The ground floor. Yeah, the ground floor. Oh, this, oh, these, uh, the piers. Those, yeah. those actually are brick. They were painted. No, they are now. Uh, but... Yeah. They're shown as black in the picture, so I'm wondering. We, yeah, th that um, we are in the process of uncovering that material to see what's underneath. Um, it's and brick. It's brick, but we don't know what we we don't know what condition that brick is in when they when they did the 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 base. So our our hope is to restore it to brick. If we can't, then we will have to cover it or paint it. Okay. 
but again, I think that we want this to all feel as one composition. So our interest is in expressing as much of the what, what I'm going to call the old fabric as possible. Well, thank you very much. I think you did a splendid job. And since I look out at that building every single day, I can look at it right now. Um, I'm very appreciative of the work that you did. And we welcome you to the neighborhood. Um, I think the loss of a garage is a big loss. And that's something I'm going to bring up in the transportation committee uh, to talk about zoning for garages. All right, let's go next to Alita Camp. I'd like to just jump in real quick and answer one question about um, construction and the closure of the garage. Sure. Uh, I believe that the garage will be closing by September 1st and kind of advanced work on the building will start. Again, they're shooting to open the school in uh, fall of 2024. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Alita, go ahead. You're gonna be unmuted. Thanks, I was. Thank you. And thank you, Browning, for your presentation. Um, so what I'm thinking is that community is obviously an important part of the Browning education. You've, sa you've said that and it's in your program materials. But community is not just the community of the school and the community of the world at large. It's also the community of the neighborhood. And zoning exists for a reason to protect the mid blocks. And even if the building fits in in size in this particular block, for me, there's a principle here, which is a 75 foot height limit. And I don't really, un I, I would just urge the school maybe to rethink your plans. I would never second guess your need to expand and to move. Um, I think that that is, is critical, um, your decision, but I do object to the idea that you're going higher. It's It may not be large to you, but it's still 10%. And um, it was a hard fought battle for the 75 foot height limit in the RAB district. So I would really urge you to respect that and to do your very best to comply with it. Secondly, I have to agree with, with um, Judy that the loss of the garage is critical to the neighborhood because uh, congestion pricing, if and when that kicks in, we'll, we're concerned, and there's been a number of concerns expressed by members of the community, that there will be an increase in traffic in that particular, on those particular blocks because of people circling or looking for places to park their cars. So with the loss of the garage, that will lead to potentially to more circling and more traffic congestion. And third, I have to say also, that with your need for the gym to be able to host other schools coming to play sports with your students, that there will be buses bringing in students from maybe sub suburban schools or schools in the Bronx or Brooklyn. And where are those buses going to stage while they're dropping off the students and picking them up? I don't think uh, just because students primarily walk and take the train, I don't know what you're going to do with other athletes or other people for events. And, and given the narrowness of, this, of the street, the bike lanes that are there, the traffic because of the bridge access and hospitals around there, I don't know, I'd like to hear a little bit more, even though it's not related to the height and the bulk, but what you're going to do with those buses. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say um, the the games that we'll be hosting um, outside schools that may um, bring students to the school via like buses or some other larger vehicles. Um, they will be, we'll work with the community and the neighborhood uh, when those vehicles are staged uh, to make sure that there's no disruption. Um, uh, and in terms of the height, I mean, the school itself um, analyzed various configurations of the building and it's explained it, uh, in more detail in our BSA application, but really the only way to accommodate the program and the athletic facility in this building was to seek this small waiver of eight feet above the 75 feet a night. Um, and so the application goes into great detail on that. Thank you. But yeah, I mean, many configurations were looked at. We'd, we'd much rather start the work right now and not have to go through a process. Good. Um, all right, let's go next to uh, Barbara Rutter. Thank you. 
I always do it too fast. Thank you very much. I have an environment question. Can you explain the roof? The, I've not heard of a green and blue roof together. Can you explain where it is, how it is together, what the purpose is? Sure. co chair of the Environment Committee, so it's very interesting. Sure, Abs absolutely. Let me just, I'll just jump to that. Um, so uh, if you see my hand. Yes. So that this area that's hatched or poche represents a plant, uh, a, a green roof, uh, sedum trays. So this would be greenery in planted uh, trays that would sit um, above the roof. Uh, below it is ab about two to four inches of um, vessels that will hold rainwater. Oh. The idea being is that in a rain event, in a, <laughs> when it rains, uh, we will be holding water on site, both at this level, at the roof level, on the terrace level, which is below one level, and in the cellar level, we will be retaining water, uh, detaining water, sorry, will be detaining water prior to discharge to the city system. So the green roof, so I'll divide it into two categories. The green roof obviously lowers heat island effect. Uh, the green roof obviously is something pleasant to look at as opposed to just mechanical equipment and roof. Um, uh, and it's a carbon sink as well. Uh, the water detention is essentially slowing down the flow of rainwater from our building into the city system. So we're essentially literally holding water for, for the buildings around us and the city around us. What do you do with the water once it's held in the vessels? It, within a 48 hour period, it'll slowly discharge into the city system. Oh, but it won't be overflowing the city system. That's that's right. And, and so the idea being, and this is something that's a citywide endeavor that, that uh, many buildings have to do and are doing. We 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 are going above and beyond the the the, the code minimum uh, on on this site. Um, but the idea being is that we are not uh, charging this the city sewer system in in heavy rain. We're we're sort of slowing it all down for everybody else to not experience flooding and overflow. And then we heard um, a presentation about a passive house. Are you, your installation when you're building, you'll make sure it's insulated and the windows are environmentally positive and so on? The school has very aggressive um, environmental goals in terms of performance. So we are, um, we are starting at Leeds Silver in terms of building right. performance. The goal is to get to gold, gold um, but the, the, the floor... Mm -hmm or the minimum that the school wants is lead to silver, which is a very high threshold. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for environmental things also. Welcome. Good, all right, next we'll go to Michelle Birnbaum and I'll just observe there's no uh, resolution right now. Um, so if somebody wants to make a resolution as well, that would be. Uh... Um, thank you, um, a couple of questions. Does the overall proposed height uh, for which you're asking the variance, the 83, feet two inches does that include the height of the mechanicals it it does not ah so how much taller are the mechanicals how much height does that add over the 83 feet i'll just pull up this section uh so right this um this I think shows it best. The, the the mechanicals are we're trying to concentrate the mechanicals into one area, um, and it's so, it, relative to Memorial Sloan Kettering's mechanical equipment. We're sort of pushing up against them. Um, their equipment is will be higher than ours, but uh, we're essentially seeing around approximately eleven feet um, at its maximum. That that not all of the equipment is eleven feet. The majority of the equipment is low at three feet. The majority of our units that we have on the roof, there are, there's uh, an energy recovery unit that is 11 feet. So it's one piece of equipment um, that is How 11 feet. How wide is that piece of equipment? It's 11 high by what? Uh, let me, I can show you in plan. I can show you in plan. So the, the unit I'm talking about is this one back here. Uh, so approximately uh, 10 feet. 10 feet wide, 11 feet high. Yep. But um, if you if you look, sorry, just if you look at this plan, you, you, the, 
the, the, these VRFCU units, these are all the low units. These are three to four feet. That's not 11 over the 83, or is it? It is. It is. It is. I'll go back okay. to the section. Let me go. I'll, I think the section shows it is. It the best. It's 11 over the 83. Right. And it's 11 over the 83 for 10 feet. And then everything drops to roughly three feet high. So that's pretty significant. Um, I take it you've, and this includes the elevator bulkhead as well, or is that even higher? I can't, uh, you know, it's small. I can't really see it. Sure, 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 sure. The uh, elevator bulkhead is uh, above the, is above the 83 feet. Is that, that's your question? Yes, it is. Yes, it it's is. It's lower than the 11. It's lower than the How 11, correct. Well, that was my question. How high is the elevator bulkhead over the 8.3, over the 83? Uh, approximately four, four to five feet. Okay, so it's lower than the 11. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Um, now talk about the materials that you're talking. Well, let me just stay with, with the side light. Let me stay on the roof for a minute. Um, you're indicating windows in that rooftop addition. And you talked about it being set back 15 feet. Is the rooftop addition set back 16, uh, 15 feet or does that include the mechanical setback also because what's lacking from all your illustration are sight lines. So unless I've missed them, we, there's no indication of sight lines of how visible the mechanicals or the rooftop addition are from various points in the street. So you said that something was set back 15 feet. Is that the rooftop addition? Fiddle, I think we have that um, slide, I think. From the, the answer is that the, the, building, the building maintains the zoning base height under 65 feet. It sets back 15 feet and then it rises to 83. So we're maintaining the, the zoning setback of 15 feet off a narrow street in the R8B. The, the, where the um, side of the building where the stair and the mechanical and the elevator overrun and bulkhead actually fall within the zoning prescribed um, dormer regulations. Um, and so the little bit that goes above the 75 feet is is part of the waiver but the actual bulkhead itself is part of the dormer regulations and falls within the height and setback requirements did you do sight lines uh for these for this construction i think it's in the presentation we yep, right there yep Can you, can you tell me what I'm looking at? It's the gray part at the top of the building. Yeah, but that's not the sight line. In other words, th that, that part is set back 15 feet. That's not a sight line. What of that, where do you see it? Do you see it on 64th Street going towards second? Do you see it going towards first? Do you see it from 65th? I mean, where do you see this? Where, what are the actual sight lines for where this is visible? I guess this, you didn't do that. This okay. rendering is showing you standing on the street on 64th Street looking south towards 2nd Avenue. Or for so it's fully visible. Okay. All right. Um, let me just go to uh, the materials. I see that there are windows on that rooftop addition. And of course, the windows and the rest of the building and the brick is beautiful. So what are you going to do about those windows? What's going to be the configuration and what are their materials? What are they made out of? Which windows exactly are you talking about? I thought, I thought on the rendering that I saw windows in the rooftop addition. The brown the part. In the yes. In the right. front and the back, there are clear. Yeah, there's a ribbon of uh, windows, um, aluminum and glass. They will have sun, sun shading, um, both for light ingress and egress. Uh, the, the school, um, the sports floor is not amenable to um, direct sunlight. So we will have uh, 
shades, controlled shades to both limit sunlight and then in the evening um, it, light emittance to, uh, to the neighbors. But those are single pane, right? <clears throat> no, those are insulated. They have to be insulated glass units. But they're one, pain. but but it's just one pane, like the rest of the building is eight over eight. Yes, yeah. these will be modern. These will be you. modern. These will be modern window. Yeah. Uh, modern storefront. So we have automatic shades that come down? Yes. Mechanical in, in, shades? Inside, yeah, inside the, the glass line. Okay, because at night, if you have a game, it'll look like a light box up there. Um, but I guess, would you draw the shades at night? We would, we would have, yes, we would have controlled shades. I, I think the, game? I think the, the, the size of these, um, the size of these windows are not set in stone at this point. We are, we are. What is the dimension? Do you know what it is? Uh, we haven't finalized it at this point. Roughly? They'll be five feet wide by maybe eight feet high. Okay. Um, also going to materials, I know you sort of didn't know what you were, your actual final plan was going to be, but I would like to ask that the uh, enclosed stairwell that you're converting from the fire escape, you said perhaps metal or perhaps the brick, I would just say the rendering looked as though it was brick and to my aesthetic, just throwing it out there, I would love it to see brick, to, to be brick rather than um, sort of a metal appendage. Uh, coming off what is a beautiful brick facade. So if you could make on the that, rear, on the rear, yeah, the rear, yeah. yeah. We're, no, but your hand you're is right. on now. Yeah, you're right. Um, sorry if I wasn't clear. Uh, the, the the intent uh, for the enclosure is to marry with the brick. So Good. Okay. the only question, the only question is just in terms of how much dimension we may or may not have um, for the enclosure. So it may we may go stucco. But the intent right now and the hope is brick. Why would the dimension make it stucco? Just in terms of details, how we figure out what we can achieve in this energy code and there's, you know, there's seismic. So uh, the, I think I agree with what you say that it should be a harmonious material. We, we don't, we agree. Okay. Um, oh, the outdoor terrace, just one or two more questions. What is the purpose and the use of that outdoor terrace and what does it face? Because if you're using it for the outdoor, uh, how does it affect its neighbors? So it faces south onto 64th Street, and it's just um, it, it's just a, a terrace that's part of the setback. It'll have a few tables and chairs, and it's for passive use. Um, uh, you know, not for any kind of uh, major gatherings or activities. It's really passive use, um, sitting. You know tables and chairs, students can gather there at certain times. Okay. And lastly, the dimensions of the canopy, the materials and the height of the lettering in the front. Um, the, the material uh, will, I, will match or marry with um, the new metal um, and color of the, of the of the infill on the arches. Um, the height of the letters, I think it'll be eight to 10, eight to 12 inches. Um, and the depth the of the canopy? Uh, the projection, I believe we are, I believe we are uh, right now showing, this is uh, preliminarily showing an eight foot uh, projection. Is that in keeping with what's permissible? Yes, it's not. We're not seeking any waivers for that. It'll be co code and zoning compliant. And the signage also, the banners yeah. that you have? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. These just, just yeah, the banners are existing locations. The, the, the banners were there historically. Yeah. The banners, everything will be code compliant, yeah. both zoning and building. All right. Okay, thank you very much for answering my questions. My concern is the height in the midlock. Um, I know your concerns, but that, that is a concern. But thank you very much. Good presentation. All right, let's go next to Kaz Bagnoletti. Yeah, uh, I have two quick questions. May One may have already been answered. I noticed in the back there's a lot more windows 
Do the, these have automatic shades so the lights will not shine out at night to the uh, next door neighbors? They, they will have shades. Um, and, and obviously if there is an issue with light pollution or something later on, um, the school will work with the neighbors to make sure that there's not a problem. Okay. And the other one, the water retention uh, for a while, um, will you be retaining any water for uh, watering of the uh, rooftop rather than discharging at all? The, will you reuse the water? The gray, well, yeah, we, I think there is going to be a gray water component to, to the... Um, no, uh, I'm talking about the rainwater that you're collecting and then discharging to the city. Will you be retaining any part of that rainwater to water the greenery on the roof? Yeah, sorry, I'm calling that gray water, but yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, let's go to Chuck Warren. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, and if it's seconded, speak to it. I'd like to move to approve uh, this yep. application. Elizabeth Rose seconds. Elizabeth Rose seconds, okay. Um, plus, we have a, one of our venerable institutions that's been in our neighborhood for many years and, and a good neighbor, from everyone said, and they're asking for the two variances here, which is the height and then the setback, and uh, very minimal. I know, and, and when you look at the surrounding area, it's not going to really, it's not going to create issues uh, with the buildings that immediately surround it, and I think it's something that we ought to approve. Thank you. Next, let's go to Elizabeth Rose. Thank you. Um, I would like to second much of what Chuck said. Investment in our schools in this community is a real driver for residential use, for the attractiveness of this community board area. Um, and it, I think it drives a lot of economic activity in the surrounding areas. I do appreciate um, some of the concerns that have been expressed about losing a parking garage, and I'll be very interested in hearing what Judy has to suggest about uh, encouraging uh, parking development in new uh, buildings and new development. Um, um, but for the most part, this is a very positive thing for this community. I think some of the other concerns that were raised about uh, buses and other schools coming in. Those are things that every private school on the Upper East Side deals with and handles mostly on narrow streets. I don't see this as being any different. And quite honestly, this is the most cogent and um, I think defensible reason for an increase in height that we have seen or that I have seen in an application since I've been on the board. There is a minimum height standard for school gymnasiums. Having a regulation size gymnasium, I think is extremely important uh, for our schools. Um, I have uh, friends whose children have attended Browning and what they said was they really get boys. They keep them moving all the time and they feed them constantly. And I thought those were, were uh, great comments about uh, a school full of young men. Um, and then I'd also just like to remind uh, my colleagues on the board that we recently approved an addition in an R8B zone to 95 feet for um, a much less clear programmatic reason. Thank you. Let's go next to Craig Leader. Thank you, Russell. Thank you to everyone for your presentation. Um, I agree entirely that this seems to be a great project and a well-reasoned request to, um, to um, obtain variances um, to um, achieve your goals. The impacts will be less than minimal I'm sh as it appears and I'm very grateful for that. I do wanna ask two different questions or two questions related to two different issues. The first one was regarding the environmental piece of it. So you had mentioned but the building was initially going to be lead silver with a goal of lead go goal of lead gold, and that's great. But I'm wondering what the expectations are regarding energy efficiency, as I see a trend that many newer buildings, even those lead certified, often obtain 
New York City energy efficiency ratings of D, which is 54 or lower, or F meaning not compliance. Um, given that this will essentially be a new building from the, an energy perspective, what is the expectation in terms of energy efficiency? I can I can answer that, Eric. If that that's, okay. uh, that's a great question. That's a very important question. And that's something that we've uh, been discussing uh, very early on. Uh, given that it's an existing building, we are, in a sense, recycling existing building fabric. Um, we are not tearing this down to make the massing work. We are, we are keeping uh, probably anywhere from 60 to 66% of the historic fabric of the building in place. We are, there is no gas to the building. This is a fully electric building. Um, I've been asked about Bunsen burners and how we're gonna do the science labs, but we're gonna do infrared. This is a fully electric building. There are, we're trying to eliminate any need for fossil fuels, um, even at the Bunsen burner level. Um, everything will obviously meet energy code and go beyond energy code because we are going to such a high environmental standard with lead uh, silver lead gold but we do not um i i think for from our perspective the the big move is uh, a fully electric building mm -hmm. do you have a sense though i don't know if you can anticipate what your grade may be i assume you'll be in compliance with local law 95 but do you have any ex expectations what you're aiming for in that respect in terms of meeting those energy efficiency um, standards and goals? The, well, our, our, we, will meet, we will meet the minimum threshold, but our goal is to meet the projections uh, through 2035, because that's when the, the city, you know, the local laws kick in with respect to electrification. So what we've said to the school now is we might as well plan for that now and go ahead and make this building fully electric, even though we don't have to we could introduce gas today, but we're not. So we're with you, like we, we're completely in line with you. And so I think the school is forward thinking uh, in terms of electrification. The simple answer is we don't know what grade we'll get from the city, but we're going for the highest possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, let's go to Marco Tamayo. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Botti. Are you the, is he, is he still there? I am, sir. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do you believe in glo global warming? Do you educate in your pension? Are there any anything about global warming in your pension? Is there anything in our curriculum regarding global warming? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, the question is why you don't apply in your own building. This, I'm relates, not, this is a question speaking? for you and for the profession of, of the records. I mean, I think this relates to the question that Greg and others asked about the environmental no, impact, no, no, but no, if you no. have a Rosso, specific Rosso, question. Rosso, different, different questions. Uh, Rosso, this different questions. I'm so what's, to, what, so, so what, what's question the question? Is, the question is next. First of all, um, leads or, or green buildings, whatever you want to call, this is a commercial certification. And you don't expect to reach that level because one of the issues of the lead is exactly you cannot um, encroach the zoning resolution. So uh, my, my point of view is, yes, you said that you're going beyond the code. This is for the professional. Yes, you say you, you retain, you detain the water. This is, this is normally in S1 and S2 calculation that you put it in the building department. Are you supposed to hold the water or use or reuse the water so you don't create centrifugal forces in the sewer system and then create serious trouble in the brain. That is required by, by the code, by the way. So my point is, um, uh, you said that you are planning to, have, to be in compliance to 30 or to 35. So that means you are planning comp uh, compliant with a, a reduction of the energy to 40% but you're never gonna reach for the 250, which is required to have 80% of reduction. Uh, yes, you use electricity, but in the way that you redesign the building, which basically you almost, you have the shell, which is uh, that you have a great opportunity 
to reduce the loads and you apparently you didn't reach that level. One and two, my, my concern is, yes, electricity probably could be, is better for the environment. Yes, better than to use gas. Absolutely, you're right. However, the, in the way that the, the system is, is working, especially Connect, usually what it does is they build according with the supply and demand. The larger the demand, the more expensive. So the school since is a wealthy if the students, it's not a problem. But the low income housing that live around this neighborhood, yes, it will impact negatively that part. Uh, so I don't see a good effort from the professional to do the right thing from the point of the environment. So now I got to go directly to zoning. In zoning, basically, you are changing the use. When you change the use and you're going beyond the 60% of the, of the building and, and repairs, so now everything has to be as a new building. Therefore, you have to have a 30 feet uh, area yard. Now, even though that you have nine feet and 11, nine feet and 11 inches on the rear yard. So uh, in reality, that's basically what you're asking. You're asking is, is 30 feet area yard to be almost wave. Uh, uh, in addition, yes, you have a, a fire escape that you enclose because obviously you, you want to be in compliance with the building code. And if you put in the, the, the entrance, basically you don't have a real yard in reality. Uh, well, from the point of view of the school, yes, you need to operate. Yes, you need, you need to go in the right track. Yes, you need for programmatic needs. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong. What I find wrong is that even that you believe in global warming, you don't do, do much. And you don't teach the, the potential students how to do the right thing in favor of the environment. Okay, let's just, Thank yeah. You. Okay, well, let's mean. focus on the merits of the application, Marco. And no, because the, the issue is- Get no, into that. The issue, no, the issue is next. He's gonna receive some benefits with- Yeah, the, yeah but, with but okay, that's fine. That's I just, fine. I, well, all I'm saying that's is, fine. let's not get into no, the, any the kind point of like, is, no, the point criticism is, no. or anything like that. That's no, all. No, That's no, all. So no. you've asked your question. No, no, no. no. Let's. No, we're going to move on. Is, Marco, Marco, Marco. Let me finish. We're going to move on. No, no. no. I, 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 it was a comment. You did finish, and it was a comment no, no. as to what the, you said. The point is, Marco, please. The point Marco, right Marco. Here, Marco. No, no, no. We're going to move on. Okay, let's go next to Rita Popper. Call the question. Is there a second? Yes, Ed Hartzog seconds. Okay, is anyone opposed to calling the question? Let's lower the hands and see if there's any opposition to calling the question. If you're in opposed, if you're in opposition to calling the question, please raise your hand right now. I'm not seeing that, Rebecca. I'll hand it over to you to do the vote. Thanks. Before I take the vote, I'd just like to remind people if you have to leave early or if you're experiencing tech issues to make sure to reach out to Will so we don't inadvertently count you as a yes if you're not present. If you'd like to vote no, abstain or not vote for cause, please raise your hand. I want to flag that right now, uh, Sarah Chu is away from her computer, so don't count her as a yes. I'll give every up. Oh. Sharon Pope Marshall. Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you, Will. I vote no. Thanks, Sharon. Give everyone another second. Seeing no um, other hands, the uh, motion is approved. Passes. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for being here and for your presentation. And good luck. So we are going to move now to the next item on the agenda, which is the Street Life Committee report. And I will turn it over to Ka since he chaired the uh, Street Life Committee meeting. Thanks, Russell. Um, okay, we had uh, all unanimous or mostly unanimous 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E, which are new applications and 2A and 2B, which were changes. Uh, one was time change and one was corporate change, very minimal. Any 
Markov. Thank you, Cos. I would like to call the, the motion of, for all unanimous approval. Thank you. Do we have a second? Yep. Um, okay. Several seconds. Hand, yep. I will hand it over to the secretaries for the roll. Anyone opposed to, to take them all together? There normally isn't. Yeah, lo lower the hands. So if you're opposed to calling the question, all right, seeing none, let's do it, secretaries. If you're voting no, abstaining, or not voting for cause, please raise your hands. And this is the vote to approve all the unanimous approvals. Yep. All right. Is anybody confused? Seeing none, resolution passes unanimously. Uh, 35 to 0 to 0. Okay, and I would defer to Russell for the next item. Okay, so then this one, um, cause had not voted for cause. So this was a uh, corporate change, and essentially the ownership of this restaurant uh, was changing, but there were going to be no other um, changes in the method of operation. And so this was uh, approved with the exception of the one not vote for cause. Judy. Or sorry, yeah, Mark. Uh, let me go to Judy because we had Mark last time. Move to approve. It's already approved. So you want to call the question, or it's already call the question. Oh, okay. sorry about that. Call the question. Sorry. Is there a second? Yes, Rita seconds. Any opposed to uh, calling the question? Nope. Okay, so let's go to the secretaries. Um. Okay, if you're voting no abstaining or not voting for cause, please raise your hand. Cause. Cause, go ahead. I'm not. You're muted. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not voting for cause. At the meeting and subsequent conversations, I was accused of having a conflict of interest, which I do not. Um, something about an ownership, which I have none and uh, also uh, on a fishing expedition, which as a teenager, I did go fishing. I caught nothing and I gave up. Thank you. I think my understanding is it has to do with a conflict in another unrelated matter. Correct. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to move to the next report. Yes. Thank you. Um, I believe that is Mays. Are any of my co-chairs on? Taina, um, I think, unfortunately, had to uh, to leave. Yeah, just, I think she left. I don't know if Vanessa's on. I don't think she is. I think it's just you. Bro. Okay, just me. Um, Take it away. So we, really briefly, we had a meeting last month where we had um, a representative from the CEC come, the Community Education Council of District 2 come, to discuss a resolution that they passed regarding school safety um, and um, just, just overall issues within schools in the wake of the recent gun violence um, in schools um, like Uvalde, Texas uh, and Buffalo. Um, that was not in a school, but just mass gun violence in New York State. Um, but there also have been a number of school safety issues that have, they were always an issue and they've been an issue before the pandemic, but they've really reappeared since the pandemic began. And now that schools have just finished the this last year, which um, was fully in person, um, there are a lot of school sa safety issues that have re-arisen uh, that are not COVID related. Um, so, uh, CEC2 passed resolu this resolution, resolution uh, 199, um, with, it has, if any of you read it, it has a number of claims about how to make schools safer, recommendations for the chance of recommendations for the Department of Education, um, and our resolution um, basically signs on to this, this resolution from CEC2 um, urging, um, the DOE to respond to the recent 
violence and weapons and threats of violence that have happened in schools, especially schools in Community Board 8, where there was a, there was a number of incidents within schools in our district this year alone. Um, so with that, any questions, Michelle? Question, does a, does a police or public safety officer, which is referred to in this uh, resolution 199 and in your resolution, are they armed? No. In New, York, in New York City, and I believe New York State, you're not allowed to bring a gun into a school unless you're a law enforcement officer. Yeah, well, I'll, I'm going to support this because to me, this is so minimal that it's the least we should be doing. If we protect our money and our banks and we protect jewelry for sale and jewelry stores, our most precious commodity is inside those schools and they should be more fully protected as well. However, I'll support this because this is about, this is about the least you can do. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Billy? Uh, I'd like to call the question. Any seconds? Barbara. Barbara, Elizabeth. Barbara, is that opposite? Any opposition to calling the question? Let's lower the hands, we'll see. Rebecca, are you opposed? Okay, that doesn't pass. Um, Sandrea, I believe this one is yours. Sandrea. Greetings all, thank you. Um, please raise your hands if you're voting no, abstaining, or not voting for cause. Jane? I'm not voting for cause because I work for the DOE. Sarah? Um, I'm abstaining, please. Mrs. Brown, I saw your hand go up. Are you not voting? Are you abstaining and not voting for cause? Voting no? You can unmute. It was an error. Okay, thank you. Just want to make sure. Okay. Okay. So seeing no more, this motion passes. Um, one. One not voting for cause, one abstention, and yeah, thank you. It passes. Thank you, uh, Russell. Sorry, can uh, did uh, can we confirm that we did not accidentally not count Mrs. Brown for the street life vote? Mrs. Brown, were you here during the street life votes? Please unmute. Yes, I was. Both of them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're up to old and new business, and I will go to Billy, if any. I'm sorry, I was going to make a motion to adjourn, but I'm happy to wait. But, no, no, that's in order, and so you've got some seconds. To... Wait, sorry, what's the issue, Rebecca? Uh, we um, have to read the tallies. Okay, we'll read the tallies, and then we will, uh, and then we will adjourn. So go, go ahead if you're ready. Yeah, so for land use item one, um, the vote passed by 35 yes, one no, and zero abstentions. For the first, all the unanimous street life items, the vote passed with a total of 38 yes, zero no, zero abstentions. Street life 2C passed with 37 yes, zero no, zero abstentions, and one not voting for cause, and um, we just need the last vote to be finished. Okay, just let me know when you, uh, when, you, when you guys have it.
we're um, the last item passed by a vote of 34 yes zero no's one abstention and one not voting for cause okay thank you um anyone opposed to adjourning I see one hand up so okay we are adjourned thank you very much everybody and we will see you all next week have a good night